We're the only system that can uh, uh, deliver UVC disinfection into an open patient bay area. And um, to deliver that today, the team is Paul Clark, who is the Hotel and Services Manager for North Wales NHS. Jeff Vinice, who is the CEO for Surferside, he's over here from the USA, and myself, Steve Marshall, who will be your contact in the UK. Um, hopefully you'll enjoy the presentation and what we have to show you, and I would encourage you afterwards to get in contact with us and invite us into your hospitals with our equipment where we can engage in more relaxed, enjoyable demonstrations and trials and dig even deeper into the technology. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Steve. Thank you all, and thanks, Nolex. So today, we're just going to go through a little bit about our design rationale. And then, because we have Paul here, I thought it'd be great just to hear some real-world insights um, from a person who's adopted UVC and has used it and has an extensive history. So as uh, Steve said, I've come over from the USA. USA is a little further ahead in its rapid adoption of UVC. Right now, uh, you know, there's about 1,000, 1,500-ish hospitals who are using UVC routinely. The rationale for all automated no-touch disinfection is really founded on th this premise, though, is that about 50% of the high-touch surfaces in healthcare are adequately disinfected after a manual clean. And it's not for lack of trying. That's not incriminating to our housekeeping or Paul's uh, hotel services teams. The demands in the technology and in the kind of census and our workloads were just overly demanded. So the throughput becomes very, very difficult. It actually, over time, is not getting better. It is getting worse. So. These high-touch surfaces have been shown and demonstrated. It's in the literature. It's very, very proven that the bed rail, the monitors, the IV pumps, those things that are frequently touched by patient, family, and healthcare staff workers are a known vector for transmission of these healthcare-associated infections. We also know now, and this was kind of took a while for uh, this to become widely assumed or known, but we know that UVC can kill these pathogens. It's proven, it's just a physical fact. Um, really the only organism that does not have good demonstrated efficacy are the prions, the mad cows, the CJDs. All other, up to and including C. diff spore, all vegetative and, and certainly virus, are very susceptible to the UVC energy. This came, I borrowed this from Dr. John Otter, who was here earlier this morning, but given the choice of improving technology or improving human behavior, of which the last uh, talk was very pertinent, uh, technology is the better choice. So what we're able to do is overcome what in time constraints or in repetitive behavior has been missed. We want to do adjunctively to manual cleaning we utilize UVC to get the pathogens. So we're just gonna go through a little bit of the design rationale. The different thing, and I guess the advance versus the first generation UVC, which has been on the market for quite some time, the way we're different is we just incorporated a lot of technology into a multiple emitter system. And I believe in the last year or two, the other difference is we've implemented in about 500 hospitals in the last several years, and we had to adapt and become good at learning and collaborating with our hospital partners. And it's one thing to teach on technology, it's another thing to be able to collaborate and train, understand objectives, and demonstrate how we can meet those and then collaborate to monitor against those. So what we do is we place multiple emitters into a single space. And really the reason or rationale for us to do so goes around three huge factors. And all UVC, whatever UVC, if you're interested and are looking at, really these three concepts are the ones that matter most. The first is shadows. It's just physics. UVC is a direct line of sight technology. 
we cannot kill those pathogens which are in shaded areas or shadowed regions. We have to have direct line of sight access. So by having three emitters in a healthcare space, we can triangulate and increase the angularity to deliver energy from more angles and minimize shadows. No system, I mean, we couldn't put an infinite number of emitters in the room to completely eradicate or eliminate shadows, but by having three, we can triangulate and deliver greater energy, and then, in so doing, we minimize the distance to more key high-touch surfaces. Any straight-line energy source, the closer you are to that source, the greater the intensity of energy. And so if we think of things in terms of chemical or pharmacologic, dose increases effectiveness. So same is true with UVC. The intensity by that proximity is greater. So in a shorter amount of time, we can deliver greater dose and reach higher levels of kill. And the third thing, which is kind of relative new learning as UVC has matured, is we want to minimize the labor. Labor goes to time, it goes to cost, and we'd rather have a workflow that is very smooth and allows for repetitive use. By having multiple emitters in that room space, we eliminate the need for repositions. This eliminates guesswork, it eliminates time, and it eliminates kind of human factors. Our real goal, we want to deliver the most amount of energy in a short time period but we also want to deliver an adequate dose so that we uh, deliver something that is germicidal. So this is what the system is comprised of, three emitters. It's connected via Bluetooth. The control tablet is what controls and is talking via Bluetooth to our safety sensors and to all three emitters which are placed in the room. Let's talk a little bit about UVC energy in itself. There's a, a spectrum of invisible light, and we happen to have chose continuous 254 nanometer UVC energy. And the reason we've done so is you can see that the slope to the curve of germicidal effect, pretty steep, we chose right at the top. And if you will, it's the sharpest knife in the drawer. 254 to 256 has the greatest inactivity or it, it damages the protein bonds at a genetic level the greatest. There are ways of doing this continuously. One of the other ways is there's a, a few systems out that use pulsated xenon. It's just been shown not to be its broad spectrum, which you would think would be good, but none of that or very little bit of that energy is in the germicidal bandwidth. And as such, the results have just been uh, pretty disappointing. So we chose continuous delivery of the most effective dose, and, and many of the other systems are, are, are similar, 254. It's about delivering that energy more than it is about what energy we are delivering. So with our three emitters, we can place them in various rooms within, or various spaces within the room, and in a single automated cycle, run through to completion. On the, the right here, you'll see what it would require to do an equivalent dose with a single emitter. It would take multiple repositions to provide the same dose. This adds up to time. This adds up to labor. It's just far less efficient. Because we're also coupling the energy of all three emitters, we can deliver greater doses in even less time, which amounts to greater kill. A lot of other systems rely on never moving, or there are several that never reposition. They will tell you to run from a single position and run it for a longer dose. We just fundamentally rely on the facts of physics, and the facts are that reflectivity of energy is just not adequate to reach dis disinfecting levels. The germicidal amount of dose delivered from reflective paint about three to seven percent. And then when we combine that with um, distance in the inverse square law, which tells us that as energy from a straight line source goes across a further distance, 
it's not linear. So that means as the distance doubles, you would think the energy would intuitively be cut in half. It's the inverse to the square, or one-fourth the amount of energy every time the distance doubles. And so reflectivity, such small amount reflects, and second of all, it requires distance to travel, and, and thus, we believe that having multiple uh, positions is far, far more effective. This shows that graphically, as you're closer to the emitter source, you're going to see that the intensity is greater. And as you get further and further away, that intensity diminishes. Typically, we're going to try and position the three emitters in a radius of approximately two meters from high touch surfaces. And one of the reasons we're also able to greater uh, enhance the intensity is rather than circumferentially delivering energy in every direction, we use what we call a parabolic reflector. We gather all the energy, we reflect it all forward, and then we use the intelligence of our algorithm to rotate in full 360 degrees to deliver a greater intensity of energy. We know what these distances are because we've taken a laser map of the room. So while there's a lot of complex, chaotic things going on in the processor, we wanted to simplify this. This is all kind of blind to the user. It's very simple. The intuitive uh, interface is done via a tablet, but it's automating for a varied position in the room and by room size. It automatically calculates the length of the cycle for the operator. This is a bird's eye view of an operating room theater. And you can see by having those three emitters, we have the kind of emanating energy to uh, kind of cover the whole room and minimize those shadows. Here's a, an animation, and this will show you a very sped up version of a three emitter cycle in an operating theater. The three towers will rotate in 360 degrees. They're taking all sorts of distance measurements and it's putting together a geometric map of the room size. After that, it quickly pivots and it identifies near field objects. So we now know the size and the cubic volume of the room and we know what objects are closest to each emitter. The algorithm will then calculate for me to deliver an adequate dose into this room where I'm positioned with all three today, I need to run in an operating theater. It's typically 20 minutes. They're larger rooms. In small rooms, it's 10 to 12 minutes. You can see the height architecture of the towers deliver energy all the way through the room column. We're disinfecting the air from the ceiling all the way to the floor. And you can see also how our parabolic concentrators deliver, similar to a flashlight or a torch, we deliver the energy where it's needed throughout that whole room, varying for distance to surfaces. And it's all done automatically. It doesn't require a lot of complex uh, or user interface. We have two modes of operation. We can do a whole room, or we can do what we call a scrub. This scrub is shown right here in an operating theater, a room, procedure room. It's very useful for multi-bedded bays where you may have privacy curtains. Instead of sending energy circumferentially and rearward, we can define a start point and an end point, and you'll see those three towers are just gonna oscillate back and forth in that user-defined space. This minimizes time, it minimizes potential risk of delivery to energy to either staff or to adjacent patients. And the reason that we're capable of doing what we call the scrub is because of our parabolic concentrator and because of our onboard laser, it allows a user to define that area or the bay and only deliver energy to those spots that are critical and key. This is a NICU. You could also position all of your workstations on wheels or other equipment and line up or arc the towers. They can be combined in greater configuration than three, and they can also be operated individually. This was a scrub on a NICU bay, um, and we just quickly oscillate over that space to deliver energy to disinfect the NICU bays. 
This is a bird's eye view of what that scrub is. We choose the right margin, choose the left margin, and those then become our borders. One of the ways that in layman's terms is very easy to describe, our whole room is like running a sprinkler system on your yard. The scrub is like setting it on the garden setting and only watering the garden. And the user chooses what that range is. We also can decouple the emitters, even though they're in configurations of three, but we can do very brief five-minute cycles in an enclosure, small space, similar to a bathroom. Many of our customers have now adopted a daily regimen in a C. diff patient. They'll do their daily cleans, and they'll run a quick five-minute cycle uh, in the bathroom. Because we have three emitters in each system, you can theoretically be doing three bathrooms simultaneous and you're running a great deal of cycles. We've learned from about 400 growing nearly now to 500 customers and we're very collaborative by our nature. We like to work and pass on and share best practices. So we've learned from the challenges all around the world. We're on virtually every continent now and we're starting to understand and learn from our customers what works. You can see many of our customers, this was the 2019, are running literally tens of thousands of cycles in a year and uh, many, many hundreds of thousands of cycle minutes. These were several that we just onboarded during the last year and you could see their rapid adoption. And it goes to utilization as provided you're delivering enough energy is very, very key to reducing the bio burden in the entire facility. We know a lot of this data because it's all captured and thrown out into the cloud. So not only is the tablet the Bluetooth operator of the system, but it's capturing 11 parameters on every single cycle to help give you intelligence and actionable information that allows you to utilize it even greater. We've been in operation at Royal Manchester. It, uh, they have one on each of their four floors, and they went through a, a, a lengthy due diligence process and are now using it extensively uh, every day. Here's a little bit about what we've learned in the recent past and what I would call our roadmap to success. We love to meet and collaborate with those that are either thinking about or evaluating the adoption of UVC and understand what are your critical areas, what are your problems, what are your targets, where is this technology potentially going to make the biggest difference. We then map to that, we train to that, we look for additional opportunities and challenge each other and then we measure to that and continuously monitor that uh, post-implementation. It's a constant kind of evaluation of our SOPs and then its continuous improvement through the constant reporting and back and forth. Ultimately, we want to do is we want to make a difference in providing a safer environment. And we believe that comes by utilization and adoption of the technology. So where there are training barriers, where there are information barriers, we've tried to help and collaborate with you to overcome those. We've developed all sorts of online and on-tablet little vignettes and training aids to facilitate on-demand learning, easy troubleshooting guides, and other quick tips. These are some maybe areas other than thinking about just a normal patient room at discharge, the operating room. Many of our customers are doing an operating theater each night or at least once a week. Other high-risk areas like burns units, transplants, the BMTs, the NICUs, the ICUs. We've started to do a lot in some of the compounding and or pharmacy areas. Many are wanting to disinfect uh, the workstations or the computers and, and other equipment, um, procedural areas, radiology, cath labs, and then, of course, isolation discharges um, and expanding that use. Here's a brief snapshot into what the dashboard looks like, a summary by month of cycle type and length and where they've been run. The detail is in the back. Really, you don't need to dive into the detail. You choose what, a, according to like a pivot table in Excel, 
create a report, and then it automatically is blasted out on the periods you choose. We look at things such as average cycle times, utilization, capacity. We look at usage by shift or by day, by hour. We look at usage by area within the hospital. And we're really trying to give you actionable intelligence. We know data is what really drives it and evidence not just from one part of the world. We really are trying to and, and uh, generating evidence from all over the world. This is uh, an environmental study. This came from a burn center and they did 320 cultures. And what they did is they did manual cleaning, cultured, looked at colonization counts. Then they did uh, UVC with surfaceide and cultured again and looked at the counts. We, uh, in 320, there were only eight with positive culture, none were pathogenic, however, and so it was a, a very, very, demonstrates kind of from a variety of locations in a room in a statistically significant N that we can eliminate and reduce pathogens. Many of the first generation systems, just because of the way they deliver energy, you know, are happy to talk about a two and a three log. And it's one of the kind of uh, bashes, I guess we should say, against UVC. Is it capable of delivering higher level kills? And across all of these studies, you can see we're well into the five and six log reduction, even on C. diff. Now, admittedly, in large room, those are gonna take longer cycle times to deliver that type of kill, but certainly five and six log reduction is very, very possible. We've done a lot of economic cost avoidance studies and we can help uh, to make that case. A lot of people are looking at C. diff and uh, we know that we can dramatically reduce C. diff. This comes from the UK. This was a Professor Wilson kind of uh, environmental and, and CFU study. And again, you can see other than C. diff where there was heavy soiling, we were in that five to six log reduction because of that multiple emitter approach from a variety of, of locations, floor corner, floor under the bed, foot rail, headboard, and bedside table. And again, reaching to and above five log reduction. We've got loads of data and more even that we're working on coming. This is an interesting slide out of uh, MedStar Georgetown. They actually suspended their daily cleans in the bathroom and immediately their C. diff rate spiked up. It directly correlated utilization to incidence uh, of C. diff. They also did a very extensive deep dive into their one year cost avoidance on just C. diff. And grant you, American healthcare economics are, are as or more messed up than even in the UK, but $1.8 million of cost avoidance on C. diff, C. diff alone um, from one healthcare system of 10 hospitals. I'm gonna quickly pass this to uh, Paul Clark, but uh, thought it'd be remiss if I didn't mention just a little bit about COVID-19 and know it's on the minds of many. I actually began uh, preparing these slides about two weeks ago. At that time on January 29, incidence was 6,165. So I updated it last night. At that time last night around 11, it was 45,204. And I came this morning and I updated it and here we are at 60,000. So we still are obviously, and you are all, we're all learning about this together. But what we do know is it acts and it is physically very much like the MERS syndrome. It's another coronavirus. It's enveloped. It's got a very thin level of protein envelope. And so what we have done is learned a lot about MERS. We're currently adopted in over 32 hospitals in Saudi Arabia. We've done extensive testing against the MERS coronavirus, and we know that it's extremely susceptible to UVC energy. This test showed in a five minute cycle at a distance of four feet, we reached a six log reduction, which is virtual, uh, well, 
FDA and CDC guideline for sterility is a six log reduction. So it's virtual eradication. So we do know that it's very susceptible. Many hospitals are preparing and as such, we, we can uh, very much show peer reviewed, this uh, appeared in the Infection Control and Hospital Epidemiology Journal and we know with great surety that we are effective against uh, coronavirus. We'll be happy to take questions, but I think it'd be very, very useful to hear from Paul about his experience with UVC. Thanks, Jeff, an amazing presentation there, and thank you to Surfside for inviting me to actually come and uh, say a few words around, uh, around UVC. Um, I'm Paul Clark. I'm the head of uh, facilities management for the Betsy Cadwallader University Health Board in North Wales. It's a very complex name. It's a very complex organisation. Um, we've uh, recently trialled the um, surface side uh, uh, triple tower UV light system in one of our main district general hospitals up in North Wales. And the reason why we wanted to trial it because. We started using HPV and UVC back in 2012. Um, basically, during, during that period of time, yeah, we've used HPV as our main um, final disinfection process, and we've kind of substituted that with, with UV, where we've had to go out and clean community hospitals or where we've been, we've been cleaning small areas. So we wanted to really see what the benefit was between the triple tower system and the single uh, tower system which we'd actually been using since that, that time. Um, over that time, we've probably built the biggest arsenal of um, UVC and HPV machines in the NHS. We've actually got, um, at the moment, last count, we had uh, 18, 18 UVC machines and, and nine HPV machines being used in the organisation. So when we brought the surface side system in on, on long-term trial, um, what we did, we chose one of our, our district general hospitals and we gave it to our dedicated deep clean teams that actually work in that, uh, um, in, 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 in that particular hospital, purely dedicated to, uh, uh, to deep cleaning. So during the trial, yeah, it was a long-term trial yeah, it was used by dedicated deep clean teams. We did over 100 applications during the period that we had the, 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 the equipment in place. And we actually made sure that it wasn't just used in, in single occupation rooms. It was actually used across a wide variety of different areas of the hospital during that, during that trial period. And as I said before, the purpose was to actually evaluate the benefit that we could actually get by using a triple, uh, uh, a triple light system. Um, so what was our feedback from our deep clean team? Um, I think the first thing that came back to us was, um, and it was a quote from one of our domestic supervisors, was, uh, surface side is great, they're not getting it back. Um, actually, it has gone back now, but uh, I think we'll be getting it back very shortly. Um, and their view on it was that even though it's got three towers, it's actually a very, very easy system to use. And the great thing for it, and this is something that we've actually learned over the eight or so years that we've had um, UV in, in our hospitals, is that when we first started with UV, um, the concept was, yeah, bring it into a room, put it in the middle of the room, and actually it worked wonders. I think what we've learned over that time is that it doesn't matter what system is out there, what UV system we're looking at. For me, yeah, UV technology, as long as it is used correctly, is absolutely fantastic. So that was their reaction to, 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 to the use of, uh, of UV. They were really, really happy with it. And for, for us as well, it actually allowed us to minimise the amount of requirements of repositioning within the, uh, uh, with, within the room. If we take a small single room, yeah, if we're using a single light system, yeah, there's possibly up to maybe five repositions that's required within that room, so we actually get maximum light exposure during that, uh, during that particular application of UV. 
So for me, it's, uh, it's brilliant, it's great. Yeah, we've trialled it, yeah, we love the system, yeah, and uh, hopefully very shortly we'll be getting it back in, yeah, and we can actually kind of carry on using it for um, the, the maximum potential that it can give us as, as an organisation. Um, for the final part of my um, little part of the presentation, um, I'd just like to give you something to think about, really, because I, I would say that today you've probably sat... In, in this room and you've seen many, many, many different PowerPoints and many, many different tables. Yeah. And actually what I wanted to do was actually finish my part of the presentation by actually discussing something around shadowing and repositioning, yeah, which actually puts it into very simple terms. We all know that, yeah. That is actually the most powerful UV system in the solar system. It produces UVA, UVB, UVC. We know that UVC yeah, is actually stopped by the, the, the ozone layer around, uh, uh, around the Earth itself. Yeah. But we still get penetration of UVA and UVB. And I would like to take you back now to last summer. Who went abroad for the holidays? I did. I went to Turkey. Yeah. I'm sure yeah, lots and lots of people went away last year. Yeah. And we got off the plane and we went to the hotel and we went straight to the pool and we got on the sunbed and we didn't bother with the suntan, the suntan cream because it was day one, wasn't it? You know? So in the evening, oh, that shower was really, really painful. So what do we do for the rest of our holiday? Just think about it. Yeah. What we do, we actually lie under the shade, don't we? And over the day, as the sun comes round and the umbrella's up, yeah, we actually reposition ourselves so that we're in the shade. Now, that's the strongest UV system in the world, which is being stopped by a simple umbrella. So what we have to look at, when we look at shadowing, if we've got an object in the way, we're not going to get light penetration on this side of the object. And that's why, going back to our original understanding of UV, we said, let's put, let's put that UV system in the middle of the room and it'll work wonders. Actually, what we need to do is make sure that we get the maximum exposure of light within that actual room. And the way we do that is actually making sure that we reposition that piece of equipment if it's a single tower system. With the surface side, we're quite lucky. We've got three towers. Yeah, so we can actually make sure that we reposition that yeah, into, a, in, 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 into the right format yeah, so that we can actually get maximum exposure. But we shouldn't just live around, yeah, we've put that system in the room. Because even with the surface side system, we might need to reposition again. And it's also really important that a lot of UV out there yeah, we'll actually say, well, the system tells us when we've actually had maximum exposure. For me, moving forward, and this is part of what we do within our organisation, we look at independent um, um, valuation whilst we're actually doing that process. And we use little dosimeters that actually cost about 20 pence. And that actually tells us exactly when we've had enough light penetration. We did an exercise... Um, in fact, it was on Monday, uh, and we actually put a UV machine in front of a bed, and we put a dosimeter on the front, and we put a dosimeter on the back of the headboard, and we gave it a minute's exposure. The one on the front, yeah, had had full exposure. It turned purple, yeah, and that's the maximum color for that dosimeter. The one on the back hadn't even had any UVC at all. So that's shadowing. Let's move on to reflection. And we say, we, we, we say that basically, OK, that, that wonder light there, if we leave it in the middle of the room, yeah, it'll reflect off the walls. But actually, what will happen, yeah, the reflection that comes off your standard white painted wall yeah, is probably about 5% of the energy. 
95% of that will actually be soaked into the wall, yeah, and it's no use at all. An example of that, going back to the sun, and then we think about the earth, and then we think about the moon, yeah? We have day and night, don't we? Because every 24 hours the earth moves. And we can see this as part of when we're using UV. At night, when it's dark, the moon is up, and we get reflection from the sun onto the moon. But actually, you, you think to yourself now, when you're on that holiday and you've burnt yourself, yeah, why don't we get sunburnt at night from the reflection of the moon? Thank you. Thanks, Paul. We've got a couple of minutes, uh, I believe, right? Uh, so I don't know if we want to take a few questions and answers, but obviously, Paul, thanks. You described uh, shadows and reinforced that, as well as proximity, um, and a lot of kind of those key points. What we're really here is to try and drive safer environments for patients and for staff. And uh, we want to collaborate with more and more of you to be able to do so. So uh, I don't know. I believe we've got some microphones. We're all pretty close here. Do we have any questions uh, at all, especially with Paul here, or technical questions on the system or other? Any, any questions whatsoever? Uh, we do use UV in our trust, but we um, don't use it on the C. diff patients. We use HPV. So how does the three-tier system with your company um, compare to HPV? And also, uh, we, uh, the single towers we use, uh, would they, the C. diff, um, would they kill off the C. diff? It's just that I haven't seen UV used against C. diff before. Yes. So much of the use of surfaceide in the existing installations is targeted at, or C. diff is prioritized. We do know that we have great effectiveness against um, C. diff. What I would say if we're comparing and contrasting HPV, HPV is going to have a significant kill. You're gonna be in the six to seven log reduction. And they are not susceptible to shadowed regions or delivery into the room. So it's about cost benefits and trade-offs. The thing that is a trade-off about HPV is setup time and the runtime. You basically are going to shut down that room between the preparation, the actual delivery of the HPV, and then the re or deconstruction of all the prep, three hours-ish. Our typical cycle is gonna be 15 to 20 minutes, and it's immediately inhabitable. So you have some of those kind of other safety concerns. While we have a capital cost up front, an economic concern, our cost to operate far lower than with HPV. So if there was one cycle, and the way I would actually probably answer this most honestly, if my daughter was in a room where we knew there had been Ebola, I'm gonna take the time and I'm gonna have HPV. If regular cycle, and we can only do so few cycles with HPV, I feel confident to rely on UVC as a modality against C. diff. Does that make sense? And, and our kills show that, even Prof Wilson um, where there had been manual cleaning, we know we can achieve a five to six log reduction on C. diff in a standard 15 minute cycle. So that's not just a, we, we don't rely on marketing, we like to rely on the evidence and what the data tell us and the, the peer reviewed literature says that UVC is effective where we can deliver energy to surface. And that's where HPV makes a bigger difference. They can cover the whole room but the trade-off is the time requirement and workflow. And if I can add to that, Jeff, uh, um, you're talking about a, a closed isolation patient room um, where HPV can be used e relatively easily, but of course on an open um, patient bay ward, it's more difficult to use HPV. So if that patient is identified as being infected on an open bay ward and, and is then isolated, how do we go about 
disinfecting that area immediately. It's, it's probably just goes for a deep clean and a manual clean. In that situation, the surface side system with a scrub feature is ideal to be wheeled in and deliver a, a good UVC disinfection in that area. Can I just uh, add an operational uh, uh, view to that? Um, I, I think that uh, HPV and UVC need to work together in regards to that. And our organisation has recently produced a document called What Clean Do We Mean? Uh, and that supports, uh, that supports both our infection prevention team and facilities team in making the decision exactly what we use, whether it's UVC or HPV, for, um, for, the, for the final disinfection. And my preference to that would be that if it was in regards to C. diff, we would HPV. 